take two minutes, uh, but I'll stop now. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Travis, can you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, uh, so um, I, I sit on appropriations, um, judiciary, and I'm the vice chair of transportation. Um, as uh, Stephanie uh, alluded to, you know, there's there's a ton of of, of initiatives and bills that you know we want to uh, support in uh, uh, this session. But uh, primarily for me, um, it, it really would be around um, uh, affordable housing uh, uh, for this session. Um, also, um, I would like to really focus on um, uh, transportation, uh, uh, lessening our carbon footprint and uh, really pushing uh, for electric vehicles uh, throughout the state. Um, and I, I think uh, I'll, I'll end there. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. And now moving on to Mr. Chris Perron. Can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thank you very much for, for having us. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, the, I'm, you know, I'm disappointed like everybody else that we're not getting pie, but today's my birthday, so I'm going to be having cake later. So I'm, I think I'm covered. Uh, and uh, I think it's it, the fact is um, we are uh, we are in the aftermath of a pandemic. We're still actually uh, in it. Uh, we're still you know, dealing with the economic impact issues that uh, uh, hit everything from you know higher food prices to to uh, rent issues to um, uh, basically uh, to energy prices and now with everything going on internationally that's something that's going to be a, a priority for for us. Uh, so I do share uh, my colleagues' concerns in, in those areas. I represent East Norwalk and, and Central uh, Norwalk uh, in the legislature in the 137th, and uh, I sit on energy and technology, which is uh, one committee, uh, finance, revenue, and bonding, which is uh, another and uh, banks. Uh, nationally, I, I uh, sit on a, a committee as part of uh, NCSL, National Co uh, Conference of State Legislatures, which is um, a, a state and local taxation task force, uh, and um, or SALT, as we call it. And uh, that's pretty much it. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Bob Duff, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for organizing. Um, my name is Bob Duff. I represent Norwalk and Darien, the State Senate. I'm the Senate Majority Leader. Um, I chair the Executive and Legislative Nominations Committee. Uh, that committee uh, hears from uh, governor's appointments for commissioners, for various boards and commissions, legislative boards and commissions. Um, so we actually, it's, it's a fascinating committee to be on. It's not a policy committee but it allows us to hear from a cross-section of people who serve our state government in paid and unpaid positions. Uh, I also serve as the vice chair of the Legislative Management Committee as well. Um, like Chris, I'm involved in the National Conference of State Legislatures. I'm on the executive committee, um, one of like 49 or something like that around the country, um, and on the foundation board there as well. Um, so I would say as majority leader, it's a, a great opportunity to uh, kind of be able to be the traffic cop in the state Senate and manage the floor, work with my colleagues to get the, the best legislation done that we can for the city of Norwalk and the state of Connecticut um, and to uh, produce uh, good bills that uh, will help move our state forward. So thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Lucy Day, thank you to introduce yourself. I will. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting us this morning. Uh, sad that we're not in person eating pie. I would have loved to, to have that, but having my coffee here. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute to say happy birthday to Chris. Um, thank you for coming out this morning. It's great to, to see you. Uh, I represent Silvermine, Brookside, Broad River, part of Cranberry, and West Norwalk, and part of New Canaan up in the legislators, the 142nd district. I sit on uh, three committees. I'm vice chair of appropriations, which is everything on the spending side of the budget. So uh, I have spent the last several weeks in public hearings, agency discussions, really going through the budget on a line-by-line -line basis. It's a lot of work, but as my background is a CPA, um, I really like it. So it's really fun. Um, 
I also sit on uh, insurance and real estate and human services. And my key priorities are really lowering the cost of healthcare. Um, I have spoken to so many of you about the rising cost of healthcare and what we can do as a legislature to address not just um, the premium costs, but also prescription drugs and ensuring that um, people are adequately covered for what they are getting. Um, I look at uh, healthcare, as, or sorry, excuse me, um, human services activities um, as part of the human services, making sure that our safety net does everything it's supposed to do and protects the um, most vulnerable. Uh, likewise, as everyone's talked about, improving transportation is really important to me. Um, and although I don't sit on environment, it is one of my favorite committees, the ones that I do serve on. And so I've been focusing on trying to support all of the um, climate and environmental initiatives that are important to our state. So thank you so much. I will put my um, address email in the chat so everyone can reach out if they have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, lastly, Ms. Terry Wood, would you please introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I apologize for getting on a little late. I looked high and low and I don't know where the link was. But anyway, thank you, Mary, for sending it. And it's always a pleasure to join you all. And thank you for organizing this this morning. Um, I also want to just remember one of your league members that just passed away, Harriet Abel, who was our daughter's first grade teacher and such a gem, so spirited. And she brought integrity and intelligence and a good spirit of fun to everything she did. And I'm so grateful for her life and certainly send memories to her her family. Um, so I'm Terry Wood. I represent the 141st district, which is uh, probably two thirds of Darien and all of Rowayton and a good part of South Norwalk. I serve on finance committee, the bonding subcommittee of finance committee, human services, and I've been on human services the longest. Um, Lucy and I are on that committee together. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a very good group. Um, and we address the Medicaid, Medicare issues for seniors. And to Lucy's point, really what we can do to make healthcare more affordable. Um, and the other committee I'm on, which I really love is higher ed. Um, even though I started my public service with founding an environmental group and working on land trust, being president of the land trust, I'm still very interested in environmental issues, but the committees, I find I can still balance those interests with serving on some different committees. Higher ed, one of my priorities is to make sure that the consolidation that is being proposed for the community colleges goes smoothly. Um, I think there should be legislative oversight. Uh, the other issue, a um, couple of things I've proposed is a scholarship granting organization tax credit. So anybody who is allowing students to have more of a school choice is this would benefit them. And it's we had terrific public hearing, a lot of broad spectrum from Black Lives Matter to suburban moms supporting this, um, both last year and this year. So I'm looking forward to hopefully getting that over the finish line. And I'm told to stop. Thank you. <laughs> Hey everyone, we need some questions in the chat. Please put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'll start with this question right here um, for Ms. Thomas. Um, <clears throat> what is the current status of raised house bill HB 5245 that seeks to prohibit a mun municipality from restricting, restricting non-resident parking at and around the beach and park entrances? And what can be improved in the future to ensure that your constituents are notified by you personally when controversial bills like this emerge? I missed the end, but I, I, I think I got the gist. Um, as most people know, we are currently in the short session. So concepts are raised, they receive a public hearing, if then the committee may take it back and deliberate and decide to pass it out of committee or not to pass it out of committee. Um, so we had a public hearing on that bill. I can't now remember if that was just a day ago or a week ago, but um, it's, a, it's a pet project of the committee chair. He has raised it every session as far as I know for the last couple. Um, 
And what came out at the public hearing, we had great people come and testify from Fairfield, Madison, and some other towns about their beach communities and about how equitable they are, how there are public shuttles, public transportation, and how they've gone um, above and beyond to make sure that parking is accessible um, for both non-residents and residents. So that gave me an opportunity to, I sit on that committee, so I can't testify, but it gave me an opportunity to ask questions and highlight the same type of approach that Norwalk has taken. Um, I will say that what the committee chair is concerned about are these towns and there are some where the resident rate might be free and the non-resident rate um, like Senator Haskell always says is over $700. And he raises this bill so that towns keep having the conversation to make sure that beaches remain a public resource and not every town can just restrict it for and make it out of reach for others. I don't expect it to pass out of committee like it didn't last year, but um, I, I think his point was made and he raised the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone, um, would, would anyone like to add anything to uh, Ms. Thomas's response? I can relate to this though. All right, wonderful. Um, the next question is for Mr. Travis Sim and Laura. Okay, our next question comes from Robert Nixon. What action on climate change and clean energy will be on the, is in the session this year? So uh, with regards to climate change, um, there, there's a whole list of, of, of uh, initiatives that will be uh, uh, addressing climate change um, uh, through the various committees. Um, but as uh, as far as uh, the the initiatives coming out of, out of those committees, I don't sit on the, on on environment committees, but I I do have discussions with a few of my colleagues from those committees, and I and I do know that um, a lot of the uh, conversations uh, around uh, the climate change is really again lessening our carbon uh, footprint uh, throughout the state. Uh, you know. Uh, really pushing for uh, 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 our rails and our buses uh, to, uh, to be electric, uh, to run by electric um, uh, and try to uh, uh, get away from uh, the fossil fuels uh, that's being uh, 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 smeared throughout the, throughout the state. Um, also, I know that there's some discussions about really uh, cleaning up the, uh, our seabed. Um, that's where a lot of our carbon uh, currently is and, and we wanna make sure that uh, uh, those areas aren't aren't disturbed where it's, it's bringing up a lot of the um, uh, 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 and excuse me for uh, for a moment, but um, I'm losing my 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 train my my train of thought here. Um, but I, I do know that there's a conversation about really uh, cleaning up that, uh, making sure that we're protecting our, our seabed and uh, where we aren't polluting the waters. Uh, that that's also um, uh, uh, important to our climate change. So. Um, I do thank you for the question though. Thank you. Ron, Ron, do you want to take that on? Um, anybody else want to chime in on that one? Sure, I'd love to chime in if I could, Laura. Thank you so much. And thank you for the important question. Um, as uh, Stephanie talked about earlier, we are in a short session. So that means legislators can't um, introduce individual bills unless it goes through um, the budget. So we're really, is a budget adjustment year. Um, but one of the things that I um, am working on is uh, an idea that came to me from one of my constituents, which is a tax credit for individuals that have um, installed a, a charging station in their home. And I will say just to, to highlight, some of my best ideas do come from constituents. So when people reach out to me with an idea, um, I can float it in front of the committee um, and uh, hopefully get some traction. This uh, initiative did have a public hearing last week and um, it has been well received within the revenue and bonding. Uh, we won't know until it uh, gets a little bit further in the legislative process um, if it will move ahead. 
Um, I understand it's getting uh, looked at by the OFA right now. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Perron, would you like to weigh in on this? I would, um, because there is a, another uh, facet of that. There is uh, basically a, a what they're calling a, a right to charge uh, uh, bill that's that's um, currently being uh, looked at by uh, Pura. Basically, uh, uh, condominium owners uh, want the option, the ability to install uh, a charger, uh, two hundred forty uh, volt for a uh, charger for their for their vehicle. Uh, and it would be sort of dovetailing with the uh, the, the 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 charging incentives uh, that we, we that passed last year, and you know would be bolstered by the legislation that uh, Representative Dayton is working on. Basically, uh, we just want to be able to provide more opportunities for people to be able to charge their vehicles. Um, the <laughs> electronic vehicles are not the easiest things in the world to get these days because there's just such a shortage of supply, but eventually that's going to work itself out and as more electronic vehicles hit the road uh i think you know people really you know are demanding and, and deserve the option to you know have uh, low-cost ways of installing and installing access to uh, uh to charge the charge the vehicles so i think that's a that's a, a big part of a, a much larger conversation in a lot of facets because it hits environment it hits um uh, uh certainly uh, energy costs uh, but it also, it's a pocketbook issue. I mean, it just hits uh, across um, a lot of different areas. Yeah, I, and Laura, I'd like to add in on that as well, Laura. Go ahead, Tara. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great question and an important subject. So many companies, vehicle manufacturing companies, I guess we can call them car companies. Everybody has, there's always a poli more politically correct term these days, um, are, have set aggressive goals for manufacturing electric vehicles by 2030. I think a number of companies have said that's their drop dead when they wanna have all electric vehicles. I think we should be looking at increasing charging stations across the state and that they all are consistent. So regardless of what kind of electric vehicle you have, you can charge it at that station. Uh, the Dunkin' Donuts where I, I fuel up before the drive home, um, I see they've got six Tesla charging stations. And this is off, this is um, for those of us, well, actually you all probably take the same path. It's exit, um, when you merge onto the Merit, you get off at that one exit and they have the charging stations there. So I think we need to increase the access to charging stations because the number of cars still have a limited um, miles you can travel before you have to convert over to your gas. So definitely support these initiatives. Thank you. I and, it, uh, and Laura, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I go ahead. In, but go ahead, Bob. I, I was um, going to sure. do you, uh, better it off and then you, back to you. Uh, Hi, Stephanie. Oh, I was just going to say quickly, a couple of things not mentioned, um, capping medium emissions on medium and heavy duty trucks. There's also a bill this year to finally eradicate uh, styrofoam basically in schools. Um, but the most important thing I want to say, I have seen Norwalk in Hartford more than I ever have before. And I see a couple of people on this call who made it a point to show up for yesterday's public hearing, who submitted testimony for the beach bill we just spoke about. Um, so I just wanna applaud. I think civic engagement is the most important thing and it has been so helpful to me and I'm sure my colleagues when we hear from you, not only about bills that you wanna propose, but also ones that you think um, we might not know about and you want to educate us um, on some of the background. So keep it up. Thanks, Norwalk. <laughs> thank you, Senator Duff. Go thank, ahead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the question I believe was on uh, the environment and other transportation, things like that. Um, so I just want to make people aware, and I have to put a plug in for one of our caucus priority bills, which is Senate Bill 4, the Connecticut Clean Air Act which expands electric vehicle rebate programs, which we talked about to include more electric vehicles. Don't forget, 20, uh, was it 2030, I think, uh, GM is going to all electric vehicles. Uh, so that's you know, gonna be really important. Uh, Connecticut, in Connecticut, we're already what's called range confident, uh, which means that people can go from point A to point B and have an electric charger in between. What we're seeing now, which is great, um, is that you know, people can charge their, charge their cars at home, they can, uh, the range now for most cars are about 400 miles. Uh, so generally, you know, people don't travel that in a week. Um, so they should be, be able to be range confident, but if you're going on a longer trip, 
Um, that obviously is a little different. Or if your legislator goes back and forth to the Capitol all the time, uh, it's a little different. But so having, you know, being range confident, having the charging vehicles, having them all over. We just um, last fall talked about them over on um, Route 7 and other places where there weren't enough, enough uh, charging stations. We have to be careful about make, trying to get uh, businesses into uh, more of kind of standard charging stations because the Tesla ones are different than most of the other ones. Um, so, and you want to also get ones that are, um, that also charge vehicles more quickly. So you have that, you have expanding installation of electric vehicle charges, like I said, uh, purchasing electric school buses in Senate Bill 4, uh, stronger emission standards for heavy duty trucks like in California, uh, incentives for electrifying heavy duty truck fleets, um, and modernizing our traffic signals so that they're more responsive um, and that they reduce um, idling time as well. And there'll be more things as well. You know, as we know, you know, resiliency issues, coastal resiliency, other types of things are extremely important. We're seeing, you know, what do we have last summer? We had maybe two or three storms that were each on their own over 100 year storms. Um, Darien had some major flooding. Uh, Norwalk's had some major flooding. Um, you know, anything around the coast has had major flooding. Uh, thankfully, in the bipartisan infrastructure deal, uh, there is uh, major funding for resiliency, um, and we just but some of it are some of it is competitive grants. So we've got to make sure that we are fighting for those grants on the federal level as well. So. Okay, thank you, Senator Duff. We also have another question. We're going to move along. This is a question by Mark Albertson, and I believe um, I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong. I think this first quote goes to uh, Mr. Perone. Is that correct? All right. Yep. Okay, the question is from Mark Albertson. What is the current status of the death with dignity bill? Um, the death with dignity bill is still um, uh, in committee. It's it's always it's come up short in in, in uh, recent years, but I don't know if made it out uh, it yet. It did. Um, and uh, but the. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if it's going to make it to the to the floor this year or, or not. If I could wanna, um, wanna... Just chime in, um, absolutely. Uh, because I did testify on uh, behalf of that bill, um, so it had a long public hearing in the Public Health Committee. That committee did pass it out. Um, many of you may recall it was the Judiciary Committee that did not pass it last year. Um, so again, it's a short session. I'm sure it's uh, behind the scenes somewhere, but it'll have to be referred, I believe, to judiciary again. Um, and again, if anyone uh, is following this bill, advocate, advocate, advocate. That will always be my best advice. Okay, next up, I'm going to go to, um, I'm trying to get, we're a little bit out of, out of out of the uh, out of the of the uh, order, but we're gonna right. we're gonna do the best we can here. Um, okay, so the next person that if they would like to weigh in would be Senator Duff. Thank you, and I know you know. Sorry to go on on the last question so long. It's just these these things are always complicated, and, and you know people want uh, long answers uh, or complete answers on these things. Um, so well, this is the dignity with bill. death. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's what dignity bill. Um, I'm a co-sponsor of the legislation, and I, you know, this one of those pieces of legislation has been around for a very long time. It's it's stalled in many different places. It's always been controversial. It's not controversial on a partisan basis between Democrats and Republicans. It's controversial amongst people because people struggle with this notion of death with dignity and how the process actually works. Um, so even I had to work to um, get there on this, and uh, but I. I over time, listening to people, listening to families, uh, I think that this is something that we should do in our state. I doubt many people would actually um, do, uh, you know, take take part in this. But I think having that option is something that uh, is humane for people, especially at the end of life for them. They should have that choice. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. Um, Ms. Dathan, would you like to weigh in on this? Uh, sure. I, I'm also a co-sponsor of this bill. Um, I have thought about it for many years, and I was really made aware of it. Um, I think it was a 2013 or so when uh, a young woman in uh, California was um, facing this issue because um, she actually um, was given a terminal diagnosis. And the testimony her husband, um, who testified in our in front of the committee this year, it was very moving. And 
One of the things that he brought to the committee, which I think shed a lot of light on this bill, was knowing that she had this option opened her mind up to try other sorts of um, treatment options that she wouldn't have probably considered um, if she hadn't had this option. So I, I was very moved by that. And again, um, it, what I understand is uh, the, the surveys say that 70% of Connecticut supports this, and but it is, it is something that people have to get, get around. And I hope people do look at the bill um, in detail to get the answers. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wood, would you like to weigh in? I would. It, it is it, it is controversial. It is very personal. I do support the concept. I've had a number of people, well, five or six that have been close to me. Um, they lost someone and they they are very strongly in support of this. I mean, through cancer and uh, that, that slow drawn out passing was very painful in a number of these situations. And I think it comes down to personal choice. It's not something forced on them. It is a personal choice. The statistic too, that's very interesting is it's a very low percentage of people who actually take advantage of that. But knowing it's there gives them a lot of comfort. So I do support it and look, it did pass committee. It did get out of public health last year. It did get stopped by judiciary and short session, so we'll see. Okay, thank you. And finally, Mr. Sims, would you like to weigh in on this question? Sure, um, so I, I've always uh, been a proponent of, of pro-choice and um, and this differ, This doesn't differ. Um, I think that the concept of, of, of again, you know, being terminally ill and, um, and you know, want to just end your life and not have your family actually go through uh, this, this lengthy ordeal, I, I think that's a that's a personal choice, and I, I truly uh, I support um, that that initiative. And um, I, and if it comes before you know the committee to vote, I will certainly I will certainly be in support of it. So I thank you for that answer. Okay, thank you. We're going to move along. Um, this question, the next question is will be started by Mr. Duff, and this is a, a question with also a note to him to thank you for all your service. <laughs> Okay. Um, several committee bills deal with renewable energy in Connecticut. For example, Senate Bill 176, an act concerning shared energy facilities. This bill seeks to continue imposing a cap on the amount of megawatts generated for solar energy. We lag behind New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts. Why are we, we reducing ability to deploy solar in our state? And what can Connecticut do to change the paradigm? Senator Duff, you're first. Great, thank you. And thanks for the kind words. I appreciate it. Um, I've supported shared solar for a number of years when I was chair of the Energy Committee and worked to uh, get it started. So I think that, you know, more, more that we can do on shared solar and other types of renewable energy, uh, we should do. Uh, frankly, conservation is one of the best ways we can um, help our environment because the energy we don't use is the cheapest energy of all. Um, but on with that, you know, doing more renewable energy and giving people choices and putting more clean energy and renewable energy on our grid is extremely important. Um, I tell people as well, you know, if, if we want to move shared solar as we do with others, we want to do, I want to do more solar. You know, I'd love to see solar like we see in other states along the medians of the highways and, and around so that it gets, that gets put on the grid. Uh, I'm a proponent of the wind energy as well. Um, and, you know, think that, uh, you know, as technology continues to move forward, that we should utilize all those things. Um, I was disappointed that we didn't have the, uh, the line that came down from the Hydro-Quebec um, facility uh, in Quebec, because that, um, that is clean energy. Uh, but glad to see that we might have, we're going to have uh, wind energy in Groton, the London area. We may have some in Bridgeport um, and that we should be doing more on people's homes as well. I purchased 100% uh, clean renewable energy myself in our house for the last 20 years. It costs a little extra, um, but it is something that if people want to make a difference right away, uh, they should be able to do that and they can do that themselves. Thank you. Ms. Dathan, you're next. Thank you very much. Uh, another uh, initiative that Senator Stuff and I are working on is actually um, and it was an idea from a constituent who came to us uh, about uh, allowing solar in um, uh, in sort of uh, 
I guess the uh, so home associations, I should probably clarify that, but um, it's home associations. And um, some of these home associations um, don't allow solar. And we need to ensure that there's no sort of um, things in place that prevent people from um, choosing to go solar. And we need to use this sort of clean energy as a state. We've been focusing in on um, clean energy initiatives for my past sort of four years um, in the legislature and um, anything that we can do to increase that. Um, I would like to um, look at net metering again. I know that's important that we um, increase um, the amount of um, energy that we can get through solar initiatives, whether they're public or they're private. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Wood. Would you like to weigh on this question? Thank you, great, great question and totally support incentivizing more solar in the state of Connecticut and more energy efficient opportunities. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Thomas. I won't try to add new content. Uh, Bob, Terry, and Lucy all said this extremely well. Um, in the Transportation Committee, we have been working on the wind a portion of that um, in New London. So I'm very excited. And I will yield the rest of my time to Rep Perone, who I'm sure has a lot to say. <laughs> Actually, we have we have a system here. And then <laughs> sorry, Mr. Perone, I have to follow the orders here. Mr. Sims goes before you, and then you can weigh it. Okay, then. So, yes, um, I, I think that uh, we as a state should be doing as much as we can uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we use solar uh, energy, you know, uh, the uh, clean renew renewable energy. And I believe uh, uh, Representative Dates and she touched on the net metering. And that's something that I think that we really have to focus on as a state. Um, it could, as net metering, that's, it's a long standing way to compensate solar. Uh, solar uh, owners uh, for excess power they put into the grid. Um, and during certain times of the day, uh, um, virtual net metering is a way to create uh, to credit the powers, the structures that are not connected directly to uh, uh, to those systems itself. So um, I will be in uh, full support of, of making sure that we continue to lessen our carbon footprint around the state by using uh, solar energy. Thank you for in for the question. Mr. Prone, uh, also we've had a, a, a follow up to this to have uh, answer the question about the cap, about the bill seeking to continue imposing the cap on the amount of megawatts generated for solar energy. If you could address that in your answer, that would be excellent. Thank you. Yeah, uh, look, you know, 176 gets sort of right to the heart of our, our energy policy. It's, it's like, what kind of uh, energy uh, policy are we gonna have uh, going forward? What's our energy strategy? And it's like, we, we need to be incentivizing uh, renewable energy sources uh, and uh, solar is, is is no exception. Uh, I think that the caps do need to be raised actually to to um, really provide uh, the the level of of uh, usage that uh, you know we want people to to do. Um, I think that it just it makes and overall it makes uh, uh, solar more attractive as as an option uh, for people. And I also think that when um, you know, there's something that also gets sort of missed in, in the uh, in the discussion here is that, it, that there's a there's an energy equity uh, discussion too. So I think that by uh, you know uh, relooking at some of the some of the restrictions uh, that we have we you know that the state has put in place over the years uh, to allow uh, more entities to to to, uh, to move or to take advantage of you know hopefully you know raise some of the some of the caps to. Uh, make sure that uh, people who want to install solar make it more uh, accessible, more affordable for people have have the opportunity to do it. I think these are discussions that have to that are are just you know one of the pillars of our our, our energy strategy going forward. And uh, I think this bill is is so important. Uh, and um, you know I, I look forward to discussing it uh, more with with folks, and I support it. <laughs> okay. I think Anna Molina has a question, yes? Wonderful, thank you. So we're gonna move on now to Ms. Uh, Lucy Dayton. Um, <clears throat> are you opposed to any of the $340 million in tax cuts that the governor has suggested in property tax credit, pension expansion, student loan tax credit, mill rate cap? If so, please explain your thinking. 
thank you so much for the question. I don't sit in the revenue and bonding committee where all of these issues and tax cuts are addressed, um, but I do have opinions on them. And what we need to do as a state is we need to make sure that uh, we make Connecticut more affordable. It is an expensive state to live in, and we want to make sure that uh, residents who live in the state are um, able to continue to live in the state. One of the initiatives that I am really focusing my effort on is a middle class um, child tax credit. Um, I'm sure that many people um, in that are listening that have children um, received um, benefit from the federal tax credit, which ended at the end of the year. And this provided a lot of relief for middle class um, families and it allowed people to, um, you know, get some extra help for their kids or um, provide um, mental health services or other things that maybe they wouldn't have been able to do um, without receiving that credit. So there is a, a similar initiative that's going on in the state and um, that's something that I'm supporting and uh, talking to the chair of the committee um, Sean um, Scanlon, who is a, a big proponent of this bill. Um, but the key thing is that we need to make sure that um, with these uh, initiatives that we are focusing in on middle class um, families to make it more affordable to live here. So thank you for the question. Absolutely, thank you. And would anyone else like to weigh in on this question as well? And I can repeat it if you need me to. Ms. Terry Wood, go ahead. I know it's on mute. <laughs> okay. Unmute. So yes, I, I am on the finance revenue and bonding committee. And yesterday we heard the um, tax report on the tax incident study from deputy from deputy commissioner Mark Bowton, who's the DRS commissioner. And one of the panelists, one of the committee members, asked the question about how much has the poverty rate increased in Connecticut since the imposition of the tax income tax in 1991. And nobody had the answer. He did, because he'd done all his research. 80% increase in the poverty rate since the start of the income tax. So it would lead to the discussion of, do we want to increase taxes? No, I don't think that that's an appropriate thing to do. And I think we all need to look at how we can create a more affordable Connecticut for everybody, especially the middle class, they're being crushed. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it. Um, certainly the governor's proposals, they all on, an, on their own have merit. I think we have to look at how we can balance that and put together a good package that makes sense for the state. But I think that's a number that, that's a staggering number, that 80% increase in the poverty rate. I mean, that's what we're trying to avoid. So I think we need to really look at how we can do a better job at that. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to uh, weigh in on this? Yep. Yes. Yep. Bob. Hi. Right, thank you. Uh, so I, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation about uh, tax cuts and being able to provide relief to uh, middle-income families and and our working families across the state of Connecticut. We've had a tough ten years uh, of budgets uh, because of the fact of. Uh, you know, recessions and also the fact of getting our financial house in order. We've had to make some very difficult decisions over the last 10 years, uh, but that has included, um, you know, making cuts, but we've also uh, dealt with head on finally paying down our pension debt that has accumulated over 60 to 70 years. Um, so uh, we've reduced our state employees. We've have, uh, we now have um, our rainy day fund filled up. We're paying down long-term pension debt. We've made actuarial payments for the last 10 years. Um, so now we're at a position where we're in a surplus. Um, we have the smallest workforce in, uh, ever and per capita since the 1950s. So, you know, I think we're in a good position where we can, we can talk about uh, providing tax relief. There's lots of ideas out there. And I think it's something that the legislature and the governor will negotiate uh, as we go through the session. Wonderful, thank you. Would anyone else like to weigh in on this question? Yeah. Um, since I sit on the Finance Revenue Bonding uh, uh, Committee also with uh, Representative Wood, uh, look, um, the, the poverty rate is, is, uh, is outrageous. And I think that our strategy has been in, in the past uh, to, to look at areas where we can uh, you know, reduce that burden. And I think that uh, in the Finance Revenue Bonding Committee now, uh, we're taking a second look at um, uh, uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit. We're taking a look at uh, 
the child tax credit, we basically uh, just being strategic about like what will improve quality of people's lives that are that are being impacted by by the the cost of living uh, in Connecticut. But this is um, but you know there were in that question there were a lot of interesting ideas. Each one is like an hour conversation. Uh, so that's it's um, I think that uh, these are questions uh, I would encourage the uh, the questioner uh, to follow up with us to uh, reach out to us and you know we can you know answer. Uh, their questions more uh, in, at length, and um, you know, than than this the uh, time uh, situation allows us. Wonderful, thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Oh, of course, Miss Thomas, absolutely. Sure, I also don't sit on those committees, um, but as my colleague Rep. Dathan said, I think we have to make sure whatever we ultimately adopt is actually helping people middle-class people, low-income people. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about, businesses. Um, small business development really drives a lot of the economy in our state. So there are some tax proposals that would provide credits for growth industries, um, apprenticeships, and other ways that we can stimulate business growth. And I think that is very important that we don't forget about that. Thank you. Wonderful. And before we move on to the next question, anyone else would like to weigh in? Good. The next question we have here is for Ms. Terry Wood. Um, <clears throat> this is on education cost share. Um, where do you stand on the ECS bill HB 5283 relative to the needs of Norwalk schools? Great question. Um, certainly Norwalk, because of the, the way the ECS, that metric, the way it's shaped, we do get shortchanged in Norwalk on ECS. And I'm not quite sure why it's existed for this long, because we've got a strong delegation. Um, we need to make sure that it's rebalanced, that there's a, a metric that's added in to account for the higher property value. Danbury kids get reimbursed at a far higher rate far might be overstated, but a higher rate than Norwalk kids. And it absolutely needs to be, be, re, be, be ugh, it's Saturday morning, rebalanced. And I totally support it. So, and nor I'm so impressed with the superintendent in Norwalk and the education the kids get. I was at Row Eight in school reading last week and it's just inspiring. The educators, the principal there, the leadership there, terrific schools, great mix of kids. And I'm very happy to support this initiative for Norwalk. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to comment? Sure. Oh, God, Lucy. God, Lucy, and I'll go. Lucy, about yep. Um, thank you so much for the, the question. I know it's a very hot topic, and ECS is only one aspect of how funds come into um, Norwalk. Um, but I agree, and I'm actually a sponsor of this bill. I testified on it because I support that we need to fully fund our ECS. Um, we need to make sure that the, I mean, it's its no longer a political thing. Everybody wants funding for our, our, our towns and our, our districts and supporting it is, is important. But what this has done is it, you know, it, it does put a, a line in the sand about how um, the model works. But I'm very much focused in on the other aspects of um, educational funding. Um, that come to our, our city, including bilingual education, IDEA, um, and some of the other pilot initiatives that are coming in. So um, we have received quite a bit of uh, investment um, as a result of the federal um, legislation and the COVID relief, the ESSER funds that came into the state. Um, and all of this has caused about a 17% increase um, to funds coming into Norwalk. But I agree that we do need to look at uh, fully funding the ECS, which would cost about $270 million um, to do that across the board. Um, I think I, my, my time's up. <laughs> Thanks. Bob? Thank you. Uh, so the bill that is currently before the Education Committee is really an extension of the bill that I had back in 2017 when I led the effort on ECS reform in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and that was during the bipartisan budget uh, that we had. Uh, the 
what we finally have right now is a is a education cost sharing formula that actually does make sense and it does work for the children of the state of Connecticut. Uh, we did were able to lower the uh, the property values so that Norwalk does receive more because that was always a huge hindrance. Beth, I'm sorry, I'm going to go more than 30 seconds. Um, so it it did lower it did help uh, Norwalk. We finally have classifications of um, English language learners. Um, that money doesn't come back until the year after because of the way the State Department of Education uh, calculates that based on how the school systems put in the data. We have uh, funding for poverty and concentrated poverty. None of that ever happened prior to uh, the 2017 change. The frustration with the 2017 change was that it was a 10 year phase in, but that was made because of the fact that we had a bipartisan budget uh, it was it was uh, insisted on by my friends on the other side of the aisle in order so that they many of their towns would be impacted more negatively on the funding um, and the cities would be getting more funding because we had the growing school district. So that was just a compromise that we made. The House bill in front of us uh, actually fully funds the formula now rather than continuing to have it phase in. And I'm totally fine with that. The other pieces of that uh, fund the other parts that weren't funded that I had advocated for, which are charter schools, public charter schools, magnet schools, and others uh, as well, so that they're part of the formula, which I had always advocated for rather than having them on the side. So everybody wants to get behind this bill. I'm happy that they are because it, it was supposed to have been done back in 2017. Um, sometimes you can't get everything that you want, um, but Norwalk has received a million and a half dollars more over this biennium for education cost sharing. In addition to the hundreds of millions of dollars of school construction. Uh, and we have seen increases over the last few years because of this new formula. And that's not including priority school money and other kinds of funding as well. So, um, you know, we, we do have a funding formula. It is a, it is a formula, it is a education formula, not a political document. Thank you. Okay, are we done with that question, Emelina? Should we go, I'll go to the next one, yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay, our next question is a, a pretty pertinent one, it's a good one. There are help wanted signs everywhere. Many businesses are having trouble finding help. What role can the state play in getting people back to work? And this first question goes to, I believe, Ms. Woods or Ms. Thomas? Right. I'd love I'd love to take that. Okay, um, well then you have it, Ms. Woods. Thank Go you. <laughs> and then Ms. Thomas, please, if you have anything to ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it speaks to the strength of our community colleges and specifically Norwalk Community College, which is an amazing asset in our community and Southern Fairfield County. We can do better job training programs. We can create connectivity between employers and their needs and they're mobile, they're nimble at NCC and they can divide, make up, pro, not make up programs, but design programs and implement programs pretty quickly to serve the needs of the employers. So often there's a gap in skill and what employers are looking for you know, employee skills and what the companies are looking for. We need to absolutely support our small businesses. I think Stephanie mentioned that earlier. Um, they are the heartbeat of our state and we need to be able to provide proper education and retooling for employees who are fully capable, but maybe don't have the specific jobs, the skills that they need. So I think there's a, a solution for that. And uh, great yeah. question. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just add, there are a lot of bills circulating, covering this from many different aspects, from trying to get people into jobs that um, we are seeing a shortage in, whether, you know, everything from minority teachers to healthcare workers. So there's talk about um, uh, skill up programs, but also workforce development pipeline programs, because a lot of these needs are not, they are immediate, but they also are expected to grow worse over the next decade. So it's everything from middle school programs to high school programs to skill up programs to making sure every single person um, who is able to work is being utilized. I know last week in Commerce, for example, we heard a bill about workforce development for um, formerly incarcerated people looking to re-enter the workforce and making sure they have the skills they need. A couple of days ago in transportation, similar program where people are still incarcerated can get their license in trucking um, because that is, that, um, 
area has a huge gap. Um, I feel like I could go on for another two minutes, but I'll stop. <laughs> if, if I, may I add, I, I love this topic. May I add one more thought? Absolutely, please. Um, Department of Economic and Community Development has very strong programming and um, Stephanie mentioned some of those programs and they're totally on top of it. And I think they're doing a terrific job in our state, making sure that the needs of employers are met with skill training. So thank you. Okay, I was also going to pipe in oh. about what the DECD is doing um, for our state. So thank you, Terry, for bringing that up. Um, we heard from the commissioner of DECD uh, last week in appropriations about some of the initiatives um, that he's doing outside the governor's workforce development um, that Stephanie alluded to. Um, so these uh, grants and other loans that are provided to small businesses really help um, jumpstart businesses um, really spark uh, economic activity. Um, we also heard from the, um, uh, the Secretary of State recently in appropriations who indicated that during the pandemic, there's been a significant increase in the number of businesses that are being registered in the state. Um, the Secretary of State does monitor all of the sort of business filings as well. So it was really interesting to hear from her um, about those initiatives in our state. So. Um, it, keep an eye, the DECD does produce a report um, about economic activity, and I would encourage people to have a look at that. Thanks for that question. And let's, um, okay, I'm going to try to get us back to the order a little bit. So Mr. Sims, and then Mr. Perone, and then Mr. Duff, how does that sound? Mr. Sims, go ahead, if you want to weigh in. If you don't, that's fine, too. Well, um, I, I, I would just say, you know, um, I, I, uh, I'm in full support of, of making sure that uh, we continue uh, uh, making sure that small businesses is, is, is the heartbeat of, of Connecticut. And we want to make sure that, you know, um, through those programs, we want to make sure that uh, through our technical colleges, our community colleges, that we are uh, uh, really, you know, uh, putting our money where our mouth is and making sure that we are training our, 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 our students uh, uh, around the state, and making sure that they are they're available to take on these, these uh these jobs. So I'm I'm certainly in full support of uh, making sure that uh, we, we do everything in our power uh, to support um, um, uh, business development here in the state. So thank you for again for the question. Thank you, Mr. Perum, on this topic. Great question. I'll try to be uh, brief. I think it's, you know, the DCD is doing a great job at just, you know, making sure that our, <laughs> our industry are, are aligned with our our, our skill set uh, with regards to uh, community colleges. So you know, aerospace, you know, healthcare, um, uh, uh, biopharma. All these, all of our sectors are um, aligned with you know, aligned as well as they could be in terms of uh, you know, what uh, what, uh, what uh, talent pipeline the, the, our community college. Is, I think is great. I think uh, on a more local level, I think PTech has done a, a, a great job at you know, pointing out that, you know, the apprenticeship model, uh, it's, I think that, uh, you know, people looking to uh, move into uh, computer science is great, but now there's talk of, of them looking, uh, expanding into uh, healthcare. There's a, a shortage of healthcare workers in our state. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is using the tools that we already have, purposing some of those to, to try to satisfy the needs of uh, different sectors i think it still has to be a priority it's been for the last several years but i think uh, between decd and the congress committee i think uh we're working hard to, to hit those uh initiatives as well okay thank you mr senator Jeff. thank you um so i think you know you got to kind of look at this more universally in the sense that uh you know what we are human resources and our people and we have to make sure that uh, we continue to not only uh, graduate uh, kids who are prepared for jobs of the 21st century, but also invest in higher education. And that, you know, we have Senate Bill 1 and 2 that deal with uh, education, early childhood education. Um, we have we have worked hard. I know all of us here have worked hard on debt-free community college, uh, and which has proven to be a huge uh, for folks in that getting access to higher education. Um, we need to expand that even further. That's been very helpful to many families across the state of Connecticut. And frankly, uh, Representative Haith and I, you know, uh, fought. Uh, I think we're having some problems with Senator Duff's audio. 
It said he left. I think I'll be back. Yeah, he froze. Uh, did anyone? Oh, let's see. I think we lost Senator Duff temporarily. The weather <laughs> is frightening in case you can see a window. <laughs> okay, right. um, I, Amalita, should we go? Let's go to the next question. What do you think? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, this one, I think we believe uh, we start with Ms. Thomas this time. Um, what is being done at the state level this term to reduce trucks on our highways? For example, to invest in barge and rail as alternatives. I am not a politician who tries to lie. I have no idea. I actually have not heard of any bills on this topic, but I see Rep Wood no, has her no. hand raised. <laughs> I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I literally have no heard idea. I can, I can talk I mean, about we, that. We keep up with a lot, but man. I know. Maybe Chris is as the transportation. Uh, Bob, Bob has his hand raised. Uh, this is back. the joy of the Duff majority leader. I yield to Bob. Well, okay. Chris, do you have anything you want to add in before I do? All right. Did you have anything you want to add in or no? Uh, sure. I mean, just the uh, last year, you know, the um, the uh, on um, the trucks, uh, you know, was uh, came up, and you know, really. Um, we're asking uh our, you know the trucks that go through the, the state of connecticut to you know just you know pay their, their their fair share that money does you know go into a special transportation fund but part of that is is you know goes towards uh you know, understanding and improving uh and making recommendations towards you know uh environmental policies that will reduce you know the, the uh, particulate matter that will uh improve the uh uh the impact uh that it's that all of this pollution has on our uh, um, on our ozone uh, levels in uh, the state of Connecticut. I mean, uh, we've been uh, several hundred people a year to the hospital with just asthma and respiratory issues. Uh, just you know, so um, what we're doing is is good. I think we need to be doing more, frankly. Uh, and um, and I'll kick it over to Bob. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't answer. Finish the last question. It was kind of really important, but. Um, basically, it was just on we have to make sure that we're investing in people so that we have those jobs and um, and that's that's going to be an important component. education is such an important component um, on the um, on reducing truck traffic. Uh, I can answer that I, because of the fact that we had the uh, person from the port Connecticut Port Authority come in and talk to us, David Korish, <clears throat> who's the chair. Uh, about ports uh, and and opening those ports in the state of Connecticut. We don't really have deep water ports here in Connecticut, but um, we can get, uh, we have New London and we have New Haven um, and we have Bridgeport. And those are our three deep water ports in the state of Connecticut. Um, we have, New London may or may not be, may have some uh, ability to get uh, uh, stuff in to, uh, lack of a better word, uh, to the state. That's going to be mostly used for uh, the wind energy and things like that. New Haven will be more for supplies uh, and also Bridgeport, which doesn't have much of anything, will probably have a hybrid of clean energy, wind energy, and also um, cargo coming into its ports if it gets dredged. Dredging has been extremely difficult right now because Connecticut and New York are having a um, a bit of a tiff on where to put the sediment uh, in Western uh, Long Island Sound. Um, but we know, and with resiliency and climate change, uh, those things are gonna have to happen more and more because uh, the way the sediment is. But so I think there are efforts to do it. They're expensive, they take time, uh, and they have been long ignored for many decades. So it's something that um, the Port Authority I know is pushing, they're funding it, um, we just have to be patient. Okay, I think we're gonna uh, move on to our our last question and um it's near and dear to us at the league and i'm gonna the first this will go to mr sims to start basically uh where do you stand on the voting on the ballot initiative the early voting and the no excuse absentee voting that we are talking about for this upcoming uh election as well as future elections and mr sims you may start uh, uh thank you for that question laura um um the absence i think that's you know, from its inception, since I've been in the uh, uh, General Assembly, I have been a, a big supporter and proponent of making sure that we had fair uh, voting laws uh, here in the state. 
Um, and we'll con I'll continue to making sure, you know, fighting and making sure that folks have uh, easy access uh, to voting here in the state of Connecticut. Um, I think that's probably one of the the the, the most important uh, uh, duties that we have as American citizens is being able to vote. And and I think that we, you know, as 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 legislators, we should be doing all that we can to making sure that we have fair and open access to voting, whether. Um, you know whether you're in, you, you, you know you're in a hospital, whether you're 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 in prison, whether you know um, you're you're sick and shut in. We want to make sure that everyone has a voice, everyone is able to uh, 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 cast their vote, and everyone that uh, be able to uh, uh, speak through their vote. So I thank you again for that question, and uh, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and making sure that we we pass the legislation in the House and in the Senate to uh, to strengthen uh, our voting laws here in Connecticut. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Perot. Uh, I agree with uh, Representative Sims. I, I think there's, you know, there's a, a national conversation about uh, what different states are doing, and and um, but I think that in in, in Connecticut, uh, there's a, just a, a lot of support for making sure that anybody uh, who wants to vote can vote and can do it in a, in a timely way. I, you know, early voting is to me a no-brainer. I mean, we are, um, you know, we. We strive for, you know, openness in our our you know, state government, our democracy are here in our state. And I think that our um our end of the day, our our job is to make sure that um, you know anybody who wants to vote can vote. And uh, people's work schedules being what they are, I agree that uh, there should be more flexibility in, in making that available. Okay, thank you, Senator Duff. Thank you. Um support it, always have. Uh, we should pass it and then ratify in the legislature. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Dathan. Uh, thank you for asking this question. It's uh, important to everybody to make sure that um, you have your say. I know Stephanie as chair of GAE could probably talk for hours on this, but um, I'm going to talk about a bill um, 184, which is extending um, through November 8th this year. Um, the ability to use the, the COVID-19 as an excuse to vote by absentee ballot. Um, I know there's still many at-risk um, populations in our state um, who are immune compromised or other fragile, um, medically fragile people. And so, um, you know, having this uh, ability is important. I'm a co-sponsor of this bill. It's been passed out of DAE, and it looks like it's going to be coming for a vote um, very soon in the Senate and the House. So, um, but I am supporting these initiatives um, for uh, the the ballot initiatives, the referendums that are coming up this year. So, thank you for asking that question. Thank you, Miss Wood, and then Miss Thomas. Yes, great. Thank you for asking the question. I supported both initiatives last year when we were voting, or two years ago when we were voting to put them on the ballot. Um, as a ballot initiative, definitely support early voting. Many states have it. Um, I think there should be limits. I don't think it should be a month long. Um, I think we do have to be aware of it is an un, it becomes an unfunded mandate on the communities, each town. So because they have to hire extra staff to do it, but we should absolutely have it. Um, being part of a commuting, as we all are, we are commuting communities. And so many people end up perjuring themselves because they vote absentee when they're not sure they're going to get back in time to vote. If a meeting comes up in New York City at 530 and they need to be there, they may miss the train to get home to vote. So I, I think it's just common sense. And on the no excuse, absolutely, I support that as well as I did the last session when we voted on it. I see it the way the Constitution, as we all know, there are six reasons you can vote absentee right now. And COVID fits under illness. And I think we expand with the Supreme Court, state Supreme Court expanded that definition to include not only personal illness, but illness around you. So definitely support both of them. Thank you. And finally, Ms. Thomas on this question. Dangerous question to ask me. I could go on for an hour. Um, <laughs> As vice, chair, time, so. <laughs> I know, as vice chair of GAE, it goes without saying, I was a very um, active proponent of both bills. Um, they're both no brainers. They are both why I got into politics in the first place because too many in the legislature had voted against them. Um, and I'll just mention one other bill that is going through the cycle this year. It just moved out of committee. Um, HB, I forget the 
number, but it is um, known as the Blumenthal Bill, which would change our statutes to actually match the Constitution. Um, our statutes have narrowed the what absentee means. Um, the Constitution just says sickness, um, whereas our statute was written to say your personal illness. So we are trying to match the two so that people who have um, caregivers, et cetera, can vote by absentee. So please advocate. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's... Um... That's our last question. That's all the time we have for today. I want to thank everybody for attending and I want to thank all who donated to our Norwalk League during Giving Day. We really appreciate all your support. And if you are looking for any more information, it's easy to go to cga.ct.gov. I believe you can follow all of the legislative stuff that's going on and there's a lot, even though it's a short session. We definitely appreciate all of your service to our, our city. And thank you, Amelia, for, for helping out with the moderating situation. And thanks to all. Have a safe day. It looks crazy yes. out there. But yep. the good news is nothing is sticking. It's just blowing around. So um, hopefully it's everybody stays pretty. safe. <laughs> Probably one of the last snowfalls. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Anna Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. 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 Thank you.